Good morning. Hello. I'm so excited. Okay. Is it showing? It is. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to talk about what I'm calling algorithmic events. And this is a topic that I've explored earlier academically. And then I am now moving into kind of exploring things a little bit closer to it practically. And so, so to start with, I wanted to say, just kind of give a brief story about how, where I'm coming from, because just to help probably see like why I'm approaching this topic this way. I spent a good chunk of my life in academia. I uh, studied at Stanford as an undergraduate master's student then went to uh, Berkeley for uh, my PhD. Then I spent a few years teaching at the University of Toronto. So it was kind of like one side of my life. And during that time, I was always interested in kind of intersection of technology, in, in particular computer science and kind of humanities and social science. So early on, it was really an interest in kind of intersectional psycholinguistics and, uh, and computer science, especially around natural language processing and communication. Um, uh, conversation management then at Berkeley, I've picked up a strong interest in sociology of globalization. So I went to Brazil and wrote an ethnography of software developers, but again, it was kind of like software meets globalization. Uh, and then at U of T, I taught uh, around those topics, topics like open source, did a study about connectivity on Twitter kind of relatively early on. And then one of the papers that I wrote with a co-author who was at the time a student of mine was trying to understand the connection between information technology and geography. And that's something that I want to give a very short summary of what the main ideas were in that paper and then turn it into a question that we could discuss that I think would be interesting. So that's kind of one side of my life. Now, in between, I've also spent a decent amount of time in academia. Between Stanford and Berkeley, I joined a, a, a dot-com startup. This was at the tail end of dot-com boom called quack.com, the most amazing logo ever. We got bought by AOL eventually, which is kind of gives you an idea of how long ago that was. And then after University of Toronto, I worked building a professional services company around kind of building software, then worked for a fintech. And then now the last few months, I've really decided I want to focus on actually bringing those two interests together with kind of everything that's happening in the world now and looking at building a startup that would improve how people meet and interact online. So it's growing on a lot of some of the ideas from my kind of academic experience and then throwing on my more um, recent industry experience trying to kind of put it all together. So we're calling it Lobby. If anyone is interested, check out we, uh, our website is lobby.app. The idea is that it's basically organizing uh, events where a large number of people can talk in small groups, kind of like breakout rooms, but where you are in control and you can talk to whoever you want. So with that in mind, let me now jump to the actual topic. This is, a, this is a picture from a really interesting book, 1890s, which is fairly soon after telephone was invented. There was a French author who wrote a science fiction book about the future. And in this book, there was a lot of different things that he kind of foreseen. And one of them was a device that he called telephonoscope. And the telephonoscope, and this is like literally right after the telephone was invented. So he's really well ahead of his time. You could basically talk to people and see them who are remote, right? And he imagined a whole bunch of interesting things. Like in this case, this is a woman in the future taking courses remotely. And then what we see is that between that book and a few other things that came out of it, this sort of dream of kind of telephonoscope has been with us for a while, right? You can see it in a lot of other kind of fiction works over the next few decades. And obviously until it wasn't the reality until relatively recently, but already in the 60s, we actually get a lot of research where people start studying of what would this look like if this were to happen and what are the awkward, what are gonna be, what's gonna be awkward about this kind of device. And there's, there's a great book from 1960s called Psychology of Telecommunications, where they talk about the fact that, well, it's gonna be awkward because if you're having cookies, you cannot share your cookies. You cannot offer a cookie to the person who is on the other side, right? So it's great analysis. Now, and I think what's interesting is that we've seen a lot of progress in that space, right? Like we are very, very close to this. Uh, we also have seen the limitations of that technology. We are struggling with that. I expect that in the next, over the next few years, we'll make more progress. And then so the presence of another person is gonna be more and more realistic and consequently we'll be able to do more and more online. 
And but so as me and, and my co-author uh, Quinn thought about what we what we also came to realize is that all of this thinking about kind of telecommunication in the form of telephonoscope as then as essentially imagined in the 1890s kind of actually falls into a particular paradigm of thinking of how technology interacts with geography and that that paradigm while awesome is also limiting and so in particular so the way we frame this paradigm is we call it it's, it's a mimesis and mimesis is basically a concept of of one thing being similar to the other and being able to re represent it right so so the video is a case of mimetic technology par excellence where I am in one place, but you see my image and my image stands for it, right? But there's also, so drawings is another form. You could also have mimesis that's te textual where you describe things that are happening somewhere that are not actually there. But one way or another, so the essence of it is that you take the representation of something and you, you, somewhere else, right? And then this spans distance. Now, what's interesting about this is that we obviously do like the mimetic technologies today are, are digital, right? So I mean, like the image, my video feed gets turned into bits, sent over the, the network as bits, and then gets reassembled. But conceptually, they are not digital in the sense that conceptually, you you take the totality of my image and you see it as a singular representation, right? So this is kind of an important part of mimetic technologies. Now. And the, so, so what we wanted to do is contrast this with what we call an algorithmic perspective. The interesting thing, so who knows who this guy is and what's the machine behind him? This is arguably one of the most, in some ways, consequential inven inventions, also from 1890s that few people actually ever remember. So this is Herman Hollerith with the uh, tabulator. So who, who knows what the tabulator is that Herman Hollerith invented? So it's basically a machine that would take, purely mechanical machine, that would take cards with holes punched in them where you could represent data as holes, so they were called punch cards, and you could feed stats of them into the machine, and then the machine could basically do things like it could sort them for you, it can find the card you need, it can add them up, and what you could do with this suddenly is you could do census, for instance. Like you could actually get precision about what kind of population you have. But more generally, so this was kind of the beginning of databases, right? This is mechanical databases from 1890s that first took off in census, then people started using them in insurance, then a lot of other awesome things happened. And now what's interesting about them is that punch cards are truly digital. I mean, they're digital not in, the same, in, a, in a way that video isn't. I mean, video goes to a digital channel, but it's not at the end of the day, it does not come to you as digital. Punch cards are digital in the sense that they take reality and they break it down into pieces where you can then operate separately on different pieces of that reality, right? And this is kind of what makes the digital technologies different. So they allow you to take representations that are not holistic, that are not sort of copies of something, but rather representations that can be sorted, rearranged, transduced, that you apply algorithms to and sort of turn them into something completely different, right? So why is that interesting to me? Is that, well, one is that, so the main thing is that, so mimetic events, right, events like video, so they strive to match reality. So far, they've usually fell short. They're getting closer, but at the, at the best, they, apart from the fact that you don't need to travel, they try to approach reality, but they, you know, they just sort of try and increasingly suck less and less, right? Now, algorithmic events, events where reality gets sort of sliced and diced, have the opportunity to potentially surpass reality. We could actually be talking about online events that better than physical events ever have been. And, and when I say better, I mean beyond just eliminating the need for travel. So the question that I wanted to kind of posit, and I'm not gonna sort of go into details of it myself in, as a lecture, but what would truly algorithmic events look like, right? And so I'll, I'll give just a couple of examples of what I have in mind, and then hopefully in a discussion we could expand on that. So think of uh, Facebook newsfeed as an example, right? Facebook newsfeed is a type of place, one could say. It's a social thing, but it's nothing like anything in the real world. It doesn't try to mimic real world. It gives you affordances that real world doesn't, right? You can 
you, you can sort of learn things about your fans that you actually probably would not learn about them if you just all got together in a large event, right? And, and part of the reason this is possible is because your fans information gets essentially rearranged, combined, kind of sliced and diced, and that's what makes it powerful. Now, an even more perhaps powerful example, and this is something I have here on the, on the right hand side, is Git, right? Like source control management systems are in another example of a medium where the bits of conversations, bits of interaction, but they are intermixed with work in such a way as to create something entirely different and where it's, I mean, Git is in no way a replacement for face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, you could have a physical office with software developers, but I mean, that doesn't mean that they no longer, I mean, so like if, if everyone is in one place, that means that they don't need to use Zoom anymore. They still need to use uh, those technologies that have this algorithmic side to it. So I wanted to consequently kind of posit this question that if we were to really think about future of events as having this algorithmic edge, how would they be different and what is the ways in which they could potentially be better than real life events ever were? Now to make it slightly more concrete, I wanted to break this down into two questions. One is, how could computation transform event experience? So if you are in the event, if technology was used beyond just bringing you into it, but rather there was computation happening while you're in it, I mean, the most obvious example is you could have algorithms suggesting who, who you should be talking to or which groups you need to be a part of, but what else could we do? And then the second one is, can we blur, how can we blur temporal and social boundaries about, about events, right? Because the kind of traditional face-to-face -face events, they, uh, they have beginning and they have an end and they also have participants and they're non-participants. And this creates certain type of social interaction, but it also uh, limits their utility, right? In a sense, if you missed it, you missed it. Now, we so see, for example, the temporal boundaries in some ways now blurred by, for instance, a lot of events publishing videos, right? So where you can actually see what happened, oh, this one included, right? You, so you could see what happened in the event even if you weren't there. But there's also, I think, other potentially interesting cases. So let's say that you go to a conference today and you meet some people from, say, a company that is potentially a partner of yours, but they're not the right people. The right people did not attend this particular event. Well, uh, in kind of today's world, you are, or pre-COVID -pre world, you're back to, I mean, you've, you've got nothing and you can make contact and contact those people later. With those kind of truly digital events, you could actually blur this distinction. You could say, well, whether you are at the event or not at the event doesn't need to be a binary thing, right? You could be brought easily into it when there is a particular person that needs to talk to you. And it allows us to reimagine those events. So with that in mind, what I wanted to do is open this to discussion and really kind of with the question of how could we rethink the future events, if we try to think of, of future events, online events, not, not just being trying to replicate real world uh, events, but potentially offering something that we have, we have never had in face-to-face -face events by use of computation. Thank you. Wow. Yui, I, I read the, the paper and it was like an hour read for me and you just package all of that in, in 10 minutes. My, my mind is blown. Okay, actually, I want to read the papers now. Do you have any research you can share with us? Oh, yeah, no, the paper is online. We, we have like um, um, a summary on current ongoing, ongoing explorations on uh, POSIT. Uh, yeah. um, and then in this one, the first reference, the very first one is Yuri Research. I have a question. Yeah, Mikhail. Just trying to kind of formulate it in my head, but basically, if you know, if these conversations that are happening through algorithms are somehow conversations being had by representations of ourselves, if you will, uh, mm. digital, like a digital representation of me based on perhaps my digital footprint or whatever, and I'm having a conversation online, but not, it's not me, it's the representation with you, Yuri, mm -hmm. uh, and your kind of digital representation, like, how do I catch up to that conversation? Like, I don't know, like what, what happens in that space? Is there another conversation going on there? Do, do you see what I'm saying? Like it's the social event, you know, a social event of, you know, representations that are kind of communicating through algorithms. Do you, you, you see what I'm saying, right? 
are you thinking of sort of essentially kind of two different agents speaking to each other? Yeah, yeah. Taking it really to the next level, perhaps. And, you know, I guess my the initial question I had in my mind is getting a, a little bit philosophical here, but um, my initial question was essentially, how do you catch up with that conversation? <laughs> I think but, I mean, to me, the question would be, what does catching up mean, right? And what kind of conversations it would make sense for those representations to have, right? Mm. Uh, and I don't know if calling them representations, I mean, to me, that it, it seems a little bit more natural to think of them as agents, right? Mm. So I think having different agents having negotiation, definitely there's a lot of value in that in many contexts. So I would extend that to be a lot more tactical, where essentially we could sort of, instead of you and I doing things, having conversations that are ultimately about coming to terms about something, we could have essentially have that interaction happen uh, through agents, but we, which then frees our time to really focus on kind of relationship building conversations, right? Unless we also figure out how to have those two agents, which would be interesting. I have a perfect example for that. I, yeah. I was um, months ago. I was in Tallinn on a conference of startups, and one of the startup there, I don't remember the name. I will, I will find and send a link. Um, they built a negotiation platform. Basically, what they did is that they built a bot which negotiated a contract, and uh, they managed last year they managed to to build proof of concept, and uh, this year they sign up with Walmart, and Walmart is using their chatbot to negotiate contracts with suppliers. They negotiated over 50 contracts, and in each contract, uh, they managed to build a win-win situation. The only guy who's losing, I think, is the guy who have to spend time chatting with a chatbot. But idea, they built a representation, like you said, like an agent, agent of the what is important for the company and what is important for supplier, right? For, for what is important for these two sides. This is codified. This is the hardest challenge they had: how to codify well, value system, or our, our, our legal requirements. They codified that. And then once they managed to do that, then they created a situation in, right now it is a bot negotiating with a real person, right? But Mikhail, as you, as you said, immediate, immediate thought like, okay, what if this uh, supplier hired the same, the same bot to do negotiation on their side, right? Wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be like two, two bots chatting together and trying to figure it out? And they definitely will do that and they will do this better than we can do because humans not really good at paying attention to many, many, many boring details. And bots are good at that. And they already proven that by 50 contracts, which are willingly signed by both sides saying like, hey, we make more money, we, we feel more secure uh, with these contracts. These contracts are better than contracts we made in a human way through, through calls, you know, in-face negotiations and all that. And another example which jumped to my mind, which I thought is, um, I guess it's, I, I thought before about it as almost like a trick. And now I'm thinking about, hey, this is exactly this algorithmic presence. When I listen to a talk on a conference, doesn't matter. I started doing this when it was in person and I continue doing that and when it's become remote. Every time when I listen to a talk and I really like the talk, I take time during the talk or immediately after to go on LinkedIn, connect to this person and write a nice note which is clearly saying, hey, I just listened to your talk and I like this and this and that about that and this is the reason why I want to connect. What it does is that it's immediately open a negotiation between me as this, this person about connecting, right? And I do it at the moment kind of, you know, what you showed with, with JIT, with JIT is allowing you to rebase, you know, connect, connect different things. It's as if, I take a part of consciousness of this person when this person will check LinkedIn in the future or immediately after talk mm -hmm. and jump back to like, hey, you just had a talk. We had this shared experience. I was a listener. He was the one who was talking. And now we connect and it makes sense, right? These connections, usually, usually people respond. Usually I have a conversation after that. Usually I have a continuation of that. So these two examples, one is, you know, a platform for negotiation exactly this crazy future, which is already happening. And another one is very basic example, but I feel as though fundamentally, conceptually, it is the same, the same sides of the present, isn't it? I, I, I think Mikhail's question and hypothesis is really fascinating. I, mean, I feel that we are our own limitation in terms of event experience. Because right now we can only be in one place at one time. So let's say I have double booked and I'm attending 
this talk and I have another talk that I would love to attend. I can't. I can only listen to the recording. So I think Mikhail's hypothesis about this digital persona allows us to be in several events at the same time. And then those personas will integrate and synthesize the information and feed it back to us. And your example earlier of connecting with the speaker could be done by the bot. And then the relationship is built. So we are expanding our boundaries beyond our physical self. Uh, I think that's fascinating. Or, 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 they, or they hate us, right? Just saying, oh my God, there's bots again. <laughs> I'll pretend to do listen Going to my, up my everywhere. Talk. <laughs> Have you guys um, have you guys seen the uh, virtual reality um, program whereby you actually can project a hologram of a person um, into the meeting room, whereby you can actually interact with the hologram of the, the person from, say, halfway around the world? It mm. kind of makes me think about that uh, from a cold presence uh, perspective. So I wanted to challenge the the sort of the comment uh, Mikhail's comment about um, to push on it a little bit or about uh, about those conversing representations. I think one thing that's interesting again, like if we apply this perspective that we tried in, uh, in this paper, is that this the conversation about representation so it represents a bit of a commitment to a mimetic perspective, right? Because we are talking about two representations talking, right? And I think the interesting thing for me is that the extent to which a lot of those conversations can be potentially considered reimagined, not as conversations, but as uh, and like an algorithmic process that just goes straight to the result. So instead of thinking of like, well, those two representations will have a conversation, we could think of like, well, I mean, what is that they would have a conversation about and are there other ways to get to the same result, right? And now that I imagine being and, and where we, it would not be, we would need to sort of, we won't need to do the work of catching up because the results would come pre-digested in a way that's easy to interact, right? So let's say uh, a simple interact example of, I guess that would be that in, regardless of how kind of the conversation between my agent and Mikhail's agent might happen and whether it would be through natural language or like REST API calls, at the end of the day, what both of us will see is that, well, here's a good time when you guys should talk and here's what you should talk about because it's already known that here is the topics on which we are aligned and here is the topics that where we can actually do business and here is the, whatever it is that's relevant in that conversation, right? in, in, in that interaction. You see what I mean? Where, so I guess I'm trying to say, instead of thinking about it as representations that converse, I would think of like how, would, what are the parts of the our face-to-face -face interaction that could be basically short-circuited, where consequently our interactions would then have a very different nature because we will come into it with this pre-digested, pre-computed common ground, right? I think that's a really interesting point. I mean, I guess the the what I've kind of found super fascinating about this is that you know essentially what we, Going back to your, what is an algorithm? It was basically codifying, uh, you know, something, right? So in this mm -hmm. case, it's codifying me uh, into, you know, algorithm, like into representations of, you know, of of who I am. Right? So so it's like it's the it's the punch card of me, right? Mm -hmm. And the punch card of you meeting up. And I guess you know, to the other point about being in in a lot of events, you know, on one hand, you could kind of you know, you can explore possibilities of conversations, you know, unlimited almost, right? Um, in that sense. And then it could, I guess, yeah, to your point, you could come back saying, okay, well, according to, you know, these algorithmic, uh, you know, what events, right? I mean, whatever, whether mm -hmm. they, are, they take time or whatever happened instantly, it's not really so important, but yeah, they could come back as knowledge and as guides as you're saying, right, a guide to, okay, well, you should talk to this. You just had, you know, conversations with a million people and here's five people that where your conversations could go potentially a very interesting place if you talk about this, this and that. You know, that's, a, I mean, that's the startup opportunity, I guess, right? No, absolutely. And I guess to, to take what you say, so the way I would imagine it is that it's not sort of case of 
two representations, two like almost like anthropomorphized representations of you and another person, but it's really a, your representation is really more of like a matrix of your interests and attributes that yeah, would be my through a machine learning algorithm of some kind with, uh, with representations from other people where the outcome of that is affordances for what you could do. Right? For conversations you should probably not have versus conversation that you should have, but also potential and opportunity to take those conversations and uh, kind of split them up where maybe like the outcome of this is that you and I need to talk, but really only for two minutes, right? Yeah. Get straight to the exact piece that we need to align on and just say yes and move on to other things, right? Or something like that. Can you imagine how tired you would be after a day of only having like super interesting, relevant conversations, <laughs> you know, like just 10 hours of like just the best conversation you could ever be having. So maybe you need some other average conversation as buffers, so then, <laughs> like you know, it's actually Perfectly positioned exactly when you need them. I think that most of you named the words that I was expecting, like a deep learning, machine learning and and like, oh, we have an avatar. Uh, but at the same time, I was like, okay, if we only get interesting thing, we will need to digest. And <laughs> should we create another algorithm to, to digest the things that are really valuable for us? So it, it brings us to another dimension already. And I'm like, wow, uh, it, it goes so far that at a certain stage, we almost like impersonate ourselves. Like, uh, okay, the machine will do the whole thing for me and I will spend five minutes uh, just uh, getting the right things. So <laughs> it's, it's funny because at a certain stage, it's like what we did on a paper with like the Reader's Digest books, like, uh, okay, just get the right thing from the book. It's, it's, it's some kind of like uh, old topic that we're trying to digitalize now. So I, I, I really love the topic, but it brings us to a second question. Uh, how will we manage our time uh, trying all to create information? If I can extend that, I, I like that, that term, you know, you, you create a representation of Then my question is, is our self even relevant anymore? Yes. Uh, and I got the same. I, I was like, I didn't want to be like uh, too pushy because it's my first time here. I like, oh, to, to, to get think that I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a crazy guy. But you're right. I'm so aligned with that. Never hesitate to push it on these events. You know, I thought about one thing I started to do recently, and I was inspired by Anthony from our community who showed me how to do that, is to really take time to, um, you know, review what I learned through, during the week and reincorporate it back to my notes, right? Because the way our brains work as well is that, at least for me, I can jump from one interesting topic to another, to another, to another, and then um, I will forget all of that in a year, right? Maybe in, in, in a few weeks, actually, if I not really incorporate it in my other things I was interested in, right? So the things I re which really influence me, usually they, they echo in my head for a while. They make it in conversations. But what, what Anton has shown me that we can do it intentionally, right? So I sit down mm -hmm. and I like, take things which inspired me this week. I try to understand why. I try to reconnect it with other things from my knowledge. I try to deepen that, right? To basically kind of my network of knowledge in my head, new things come in. I think they're interested. Why I think they're interested. How they connected to other things I know. What I don't know about that, right? And I do this deep dive. And what, you, what you're thinking like pre-digest, like this is something interesting because it's almost like cooked, cooked food, right? Raw food is, is half nutrients and all of that. Machines definitely are already doing this job of cooking information for us and sometimes making like a fast food, right? So social media like Twitter feed or Facebook feed can feel like fast food of stuff we like in terms of information and we could get like unhealthy on that, right? But there's another aspect which is absolutely fascinating which you just show that it's cooking information for us so that we can digest what we maybe do need, right? And then if it taken to the next level, if it's not just my interest, but what if it will be in, you know, taking into account what I already know and helping me to incorporate this knowledge in my human, you know, in my human um, uh, uh, neuron network of things, right? What, what, if, what is the goal of it will be not to just hijack my attention, but really help me to learn. 
Well, there are programs that attempt to do that out there. Um, I would argue that none of them are doing a very good job right now. Um, learning is a really, it's a really complex process when you talk about like sometimes you learn a bunch of things and I, it takes time to process and reflect. Um, that is how our brains work, right? Like you don't make the connections right away. It, you, you look at uh, neural imaging, like it takes time to develop your neural networks. It takes yeah. weeks. And, um, and yeah, like a lot of educational theories is based on connecting to prior knowledge, right? That's the whole field of constructivism of understanding um, how we learn, especially in adult learning theory, is that you don't just arbitrarily feed knowledge to you, but is to making the connection of what you already know and build on top of that. So I am very um, skeptical about, uh, I, I'm a computer scientist, I'm trained in this field, but I'm, I've seen just so many misuse or misunderstanding of how algorithm can serve us and without really challenging or questioning is this is it actually serving our needs or do we need to examine it a little bit more closely mm. and i only am interested in from an education perspective because that's my training i focus only on computer and learning so um Perhaps it helps with other kind of human connections. It, perhaps it helped with events, but I didn't research in that. I don't know. But I'm also very interested in um, when you mention affordance. <clears throat> it is something that we look at um, in learning about understanding affordance of technologies and how we connect that into our learning experiences. So, um, so definitely um, there's a lot to unpack in that space. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to continue this conversation for the whole meetup, but we have Oscar next. Yuri, could you could you maybe say a few words to summarize and let us close it for now and continue, hopefully, in an algorithmic way? I, um, I, I don't know if I have a summary, I think, because I think that for me, what's fascinating about that space is that we have seen already uh, the, the impact of, of those things, right? But we, I, I think we're only starting to imagine, I think it's very easy to imagine what it would be like to have better mimetic representations, but I think that the, the, those algorithmic events offer potentially such a transformative experience that it's actually really hard to, uh, to think about what it's going to be like. And I think that to, we, we've seen that with things like social media in a sense that I think that like they're so different from how people imagined it in the 90s, right? Like in the 90s, people imagined that, well, in the future, there's going to be avatars and people are going to wear VR glasses and interact with each other online, but no one imagined yeah. social media. And I think that now what's kind of interesting is to think about, well, what's the next step there? Because I think it could end up being very, very different from what anyone of us imagines. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your wisdom on that. I really want to continue this conversation. This video is just one talk from DXT Meetup by POSIT. Please join us at posit.place. Subscribe to this channel and join us at Discord. Thank you. Yeah, and we have a podcast. <laughs>